the passage of Scripture that we have been using as our main text, a kind of waterhead, or headwater, I should say, of streams that flow down that we have been following through God's Word with respect to this subject of parenting or bringing up our children, has been Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, where we read again, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray and ask again God's help on our time together as we look at his word this morning. Father, we ask that you would help us giving your spirit to open our understanding. Pray that in the way that you breathed on the disciples in that room and opened their understanding, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would do the same work in us here this morning. As we look at the scriptures together, your word that you have given And as we seek to apply it to our own lives, and particularly in this task of rearing children whom you have given, and you would help us to think your thoughts after you, and in obedience to order our homes, our lives, according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This text in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 has been, as I said, the headwater of two streams of instruction that we have been exploring together in this series on biblical parenting. In recent weeks, we have been considering what God the Holy Spirit has revealed in the Scriptures about the vital task of fathers and mothers to instruct or to admonish their children. And in connection with with this, I've suggested that in the Word of God, He has given the book of Proverbs as a rich deposit of parental instruction and admonition. Now, I recommend a commentary that came into my hands some number of years ago on the book of Proverbs by Charles Bridges. And if you don't have this in your library at home, I suggest highly suggest you get your hands on it and put it into your libraries at home. And it can be a very helpful tool in making better use of this portion of God's Word when you seek to instruct your children according to the very rich deposit God has given here in the Scriptures. And in his preface, Bridges refers to Proverbs as a book for the young. And he goes on to write, it takes them as it were by the hand, sets up way marks to warn against coming danger and imminent temptations, and allures them into the bright ways of God by the most engaging motives. And never surely was the object so momentous as at the present day. Our young are growing up at a period when the foundations of the earth are out of course and when subtle and restless efforts are being made to poison their hearts and pervert their ways. Nothing, therefore, can be more important. Nothing, therefore, can be more important than to fortify them with sound principles. Now keep in mind, he wrote those words in 1846. And there have been nearly 200 years more of subtle ways of poisoning the hearts of our children and perverting their ways. How much more, then, is it important to fortify them with sound principles? 
Now, in our last time together, I listed several categories of admonitions that appear again and again throughout the book of Proverbs, and I listed them, I listed nine of them, but acknowledged that we would be able to only to open up two of them in the time allotted in this 10-part series, which comes to a conclusion this morning. And last time together, in our last Lord's Day, we took up the first of those lines of instruction or major categories of admonition to our children, which I called being attentive, teaching them to be attentive listeners to parental instruction, guidance, and warning. This morning, we'll take up the second of those major categories of instruction, which I am calling, and you can see there in your outlines, to teach them to desire, welcome, and heed, rebuke, correction, and counsel. And the same way that I did last time we were together in looking at the book of Proverbs, I want to again set a pattern for how to approach this book with your children. How to take a survey of the texts of Scripture, walk through them, read them, it doesn't really even need, in many cases, a lot of commentary. It's very, the truths of these texts of Scripture lie right on the surface. You can understand what Solomon's saying. Your children can understand what Solomon is saying when he says many of these Proverbs. But in some places, there might need some additional explanation. And this is where books like Bridges comes in very helpful to help you to understand what is the proverb getting at? What is Solomon's message here? What are some practical ways of applying that to my children in the same way that Solomon applied it to his children? But taking a survey of several verses and then asking the question, what then practically does that require of us as parents? So that's where we're headed this morning. We'll do a quick survey of several key passages on this, in this category of teaching them to desire, welcome, and heed, rebuke, correction, and counsel. And then I'll conclude by applying it to us as parents, asking the question, what does it require then of us? Turn with me first of all to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 11 and 12. Here we read, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now here the wise man Solomon is admonishing his son. And his admonition is basically in two parts. Two things he admonishes his son to avoid. The first is do not despise. The second is do not detest. Do not despise. What that word means is don't simply just hear it with your ears, but then cast it off. Yes, I've heard what you said, Dad, but I'm not going to listen to you. I heard it with my ears, but when I say I'm not going to listen to you, that means I'm not going to take it on board. I'm not going to take it to heart. I'm going to despise what you have said. And the end result is to cast off that admonition, that counsel, to refuse it, to reject it. That's what the word means. And Solomon admonishes his sons, don't do that. Don't despise when counsel comes to you. But he secondly says, do not detest it. In other words, do not have feelings of disgust or of repugnancy for it. This is the warning that he gives. And two things are in view when Solomon is giving this warning to his son. Two things are in view here with regards to chastening and correction. And in avoiding these two negative things, the positive things that he is encouraging of his sons is that of reception and of retention. 
Don't reject. The opposite, therefore, is to receive. And don't detest. Don't have feelings of repugnancy or of disgust for the counsel that you've heard, but rather retain it, hold it, cherish it in your heart. This is what he's admonishing his sons to do. And this is what leads us to this major category, teaching our children, which is what Solomon is doing. When counsel comes to you, beware of these natural responses to it, which is to reject and to despise it. But rather teach your children as Solomon is doing, that when counsel comes to your ears, learn to receive and cherish it. Why do we need to learn that? One word, pride. It is our pride that sets us up to failure when counsel comes to us. If we get so much in the habit of listening to our native, proud selves when counsel, when someone comes to us, when moms or dads come to children and we know that their hearts are deceitful, that they are proud, that they are given over to sinful inclinations, we already know all of that. And why would we be surprised when we come to them and say, my son, and immediately the petulant face is put on. The attitude shows up. Where'd that come from? Pride. Even in a little child, he doesn't have to learn that. He's born with it. Adam provided that for you and me and our children. So we need to teach them that when counsel comes to your ears, receive, retain, cherish. Now turn over with me to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9 and verses 7 to 9. And here we read, He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. And he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still, he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. Now, in this portion of Scripture, in Solomon's counsel that he is giving, he is addressing not only the hearer of counsel, he is also addressing the giver of counsel. And there needs to be discernment. So we start first with the giver. It is necessary that those who give reproof and correction do it with wise discernment. But once that has been addressed, now the attention turns to the one receiving the correction. Listen to Bridges on this passage. The wise and just man gladly encourages well-timed reproof. Conscious of his own failings, he loves his reprover as a friend to his best interest, and he would receive instruction even from the lowest as a means of becoming yet wiser and increasing in learning. And in his portion on a portion of commentary on this particular text of scripture, he also points to a poignant example of David, who embodied this very thing. The occasion was in 1 Samuel chapter 25, which we will not go to read. I will just set up for, uh, for you what the situation was. David had gone with his men to on occasion to a place where he asked help of a man named Nabal. And Nabal simply ridiculed David and his men and would not provide any help for him, whatever, but chased him out and, and basically ridiculed him very badly. And David left. And David had determined 
that he would go back with his men to that man's household and he would destroy all the men for they're not coming to his aid at a time of severe need, both personally and politically. But before he could go there and do what he had determined in his mind to do, Nabal's wife, who'd heard of what was going on, who'd heard what her very mean husband had done, had gone ahead of David and met him in the way and brought gifts to him and she admonished him and brought good counsel to him about not doing what he determined to do but to protect himself and his reputation that he might not bring harm to him or to the name of the Lord God and then in response to her counsel David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, Unless you had hurried and come to meet me surely by morning, no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Now here was a man of war. He was a man who was accustomed to, to determining a plan of action and carrying out that plan of action, and in this case was met by a woman who came to him with what was apparently good counsel, and his heart was able to be turned, receiving the wisdom of her admonition. Oh, that we would be like David was a man after God's own heart. And oh, that we could say, like another proverb, faithful are the wounds of a friend. I might paraphrase that. Faithful are the words of a friend, even those that wound. What is it that is being wounded, by the way? One word, our pride. And if you knew there was something in you that was taking you down, destroying your soul, and you have an opportunity to wound that thing within you, would you receive that opportunity? Would you take that opportunity? Would you welcome that opportunity? I dare say we all should. We know that that pride within every one of us could be wounded and weakened. And in wounding it and weakening it, we become more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ, who was meek and lowly and easy to be entreated. And we should welcome Every opportunity, every means that comes to us, that wounds that enemy that lies within every one of us. Now turn over with me to Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The agreement of the multitude gives safety to our decision, Bridges writes. And even their differences, by giving both sides of the question, enables us to better ponder our own path and have more safety. 
So he envisions a situation where we've got a problem. We've got a need. Uh, we don't know what to do. We're asking folks to give us their advice, their counsel. And there is safety in going to those counselors and asking what they would do in this situation, what they would advise you to do given your circumstances. And there are times when it's obvious to all that you ask that this is there's only one course of action that is really the right one, the wisest one, and all of them tend to agree. But there are other occasions, other kinds of problems, where one counselor might say one thing, another says another thing, and the third says something even more different. And even in those times of getting counsel, when you don't know which one of these to now choose, at least you've heard different aspects of the problem. And even then, there's safety. Because now this enables you, according to Bridges, it enables you to ponder your path even more carefully, having seen other sides of the question. And even then, when counselors themselves do not agree, even then, we are gaining wisdom. The point here is that the one who is wise to walk in the way that is safe is the one who seeks out the counsel of others and is not so conceited that he thinks he must do it all on his own. Now, men in the room, this is a fault of ours, is it not? How many of us can say on any topic, how often do we go and seek someone else's counsel before we first try to do it and figure it out all on our own? Why is that? One word, pride. It is our pride. Honey, don't you think we ought to stop and ask directions? Now, that's the old proverbial example of this very thing, isn't it? Don't you think we ought to stop in the gas station and ask directions? No, 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 I got it. I got an innate sense of direction. Sure you do. But we're lost. <laughs> so where does your direction begin? Asking, seeking, welcoming. It's a glaring fault of ours, men. Not exclusively, but it, it is predominantly the mark of a man's pride not to seek the counsel of others. It is a mark of sinful pride against which we must, we must constantly fight. And men, teach your children early. Teach your sons, especially early, how wise it is to seek and to welcome counsel from others. It is not a sign of weakness, but it is a sign of wisdom in light of our weakness. Be those who desire who welcome and who heed admonition, warning, and counsel. Finally, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, in our household, one of the rules that we constantly reminded our own daughters of was we don't call each other stupid. We don't use that word in our house because usually it meant a derogatory thing. It was something that was you were looking down on another person. But in this case, the Proverbs, the writer Solomon is not using it in a derogatory sense. He is calling it calling the person who hates correction, he is calling them exactly what they are. They are being beast-like. They are being like a being that has no sense. They are being animalistic. 
they are being stupid. We think, well, no, my dog is really smart. Well, your dog has the appearance of some kind of intelligence, but really it doesn't reason. Animals don't. And the proverbial stupid beast, Matt, you can back me up on this, is the cow. <laughs> you, I saw the smile on Christina's face. I kind of figured that might have been what was going on there. I've worked with enough cows in my time, in my lifetime, to know that's the primary example of a stupid beast. Don't be like that. Don't be like a beast. When someone comes with counsel, this is how we should teach our children. When daddy comes to you and tells you something that you need to hear, when daddy or mommy comes to you and tells you something, even if you don't enjoy what we are about to tell you, don't hate what we're telling you. Love the fact that mom and dad are coming to you like this. Love counsel. Love to be instructed. Seek counsel from others. Teach them early. This is a good and wise practice. And it is not a sign of weakness. Rather, it is a sign of great godly wisdom in light of our weakness. Instruction, as the contrast teaches here, chiefly implies discipline. That most needful course for acquiring spiritual knowledge. It means there's some work that has to be done. For so contrary is it to our proud hearts that the submission of the will is the only road to Christian attainment. Yet the value of this attainment abundantly covers the cost. It costs us something to be instructed. It costs us something to be reproved. It costs us something to be admonished. But the value that it yields far outweighs the cost. But that irritable pride, Bridges writes, that hates reproof as if it were an affront personally to be told of our faults, that irritable pride argues not only a lack of grace, but a lack of understanding. It shows brutish folly, like a horse, which bites and kicks at the man who performs on it a painful operation but a necessary operation to remove the dangerous disease. All the horse knows is, ouch, 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 stop, kick, bite. He doesn't reason in the fact that, oh, you're doing something that's going to help me and benefit me later, so I'll stop kicking now. No, that's not what a horse does. A horse acts like a horse, a beast. All he knows is, stop hurting me right now. But a wise receiver who is not being brutish, animalistic, he says, ouch, ouch, my pride. But thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you because I know this is going to lead to something that is good for my soul. Oh, for a teachable spirit to sit at the feet of our divine master and learn of him. And I listed for you there in your notes, in your outline, several other texts to go and to look at and ponder on your own. And I'll leave those to you to look over and to learn from. But in the second part of our time together this morning, I now want to come to the practical requirements of us as parents. And the first is this. There must be in us a genuine desire and willing reception of these things ourselves. In other words, we must be a commendable example of a humble receiver of 
counsel, admonition, and warning. Set the example before the eyes of your children of one who desires and welcomes and heeds reproof and correction and counsel. I was just talking with Cindy not too many weeks ago, last week, in anticipation of this very point. And I was lamenting to Cindy how after 63 years of living in this world, I still haven't learned how not to bristle when someone brings a word of admonition to me. Immediately, it seems, even from a dear friend, pointing something out to me that I apparently have a blind spot for, and what's my immediate reaction? Bristle. Offense. I know better. I know what I'm doing. Let me do this. Let me figure this out. Where does that come from? One word. Pride. Naturally, because of our sinful pride, we bristle when these things are directed at us. So let us resolve, mom and dad, resolve yourselves to mortify this sinful pride in yourselves and show the kind of godly humility that is pictured in the individual who goes about with his cup, seeking good and wise counselors to fill it. Just going about saying, hey, look, my cup's empty. Can you put something wise in there for me? My cup's empty. Can you put something wise in here for me? He's proactive. Not only is he bristle when it comes, but he desires it. All these words that I've chosen in this major category of counsel from the book of Proverbs, this major category of admonition, all of these verbs are important. Desire, welcome, and heed. And many of us will teach our children they ought to only heed when someone comes and gives you instruction. Heed that counsel. Heed that counsel. But then we allow them to bristle. Even though they might eventually get around to heeding what they've been told and instructed, we allow them to bristle. We allow them to not welcome what they've heard, even though they might eventually heed it. Heeding's good enough. That's a low bar. Let's raise the bar. Teach your children to welcome when counselors come to them, when dad comes to them, when mom comes to them, when a good friend comes to them, and all their lives when counselors of any kind come to them, pastors, teachers, an officer who pulls them over on the side of the highway, that they might not bristle when someone who has a right and a position to give counsel to them, they welcome it. A welcome it, but now let's raise the bar yet higher. Teach them to desire it. To desire is to go around and say to those they know to be wise and good, can you teach me? Can you show me? I'm afraid I've got these blind spots. I'm afraid I've got areas of my own life and my own behavior that obviously need work on, but not obvious enough to me. Can you teach me? Would you teach me? It puts a whole new perspective on coming here on the Lord's Day and sitting under the sound ministry of God's word, coming here not just to warm a pew, not just to put in an appearance, but to come here to actually desire to be instructed from God's word and become more wise. 
to fear God, which is the beginning of wisdom. So there should be in every one of us, moms and dads, a genuine desire and willing reception of these things. In other words, do not be like Nabal, but be more like Abigail. Secondly, what else is required of us as parents? There should be in our homes, in our interaction with our children, an unwillingness on our part to tolerate in our children a wrong response to parental admonition. And we have all seen it. We come and we say to the little one, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. This is what I would like you to accomplish. And we see them responding in a way that is not welcoming, desiring, and maybe not even heeding what we have just now admonished them to do. And we must not think that it is merely a phase or that kids will be kids when your corrections and reproofs are met with a sullenness or a bristling pouting. In addition to the matter about which you are addressing them, this now has become a matter of instruction and of correction. My wife and I many times have used this phrase, and I think I might have even used it during some part of this 10-part series. You go, to one of your, you go to one of your children. We went to one of our children, and we would uh, say something, teach something, and it was not received well. And there was a great temptation to let that response go by, as long as they did what we originally came to tell them and to instruct them about. But now, the issue is not the issue. The issue we originally came to them with is no longer the issue. There has become now a very apparent need that must be addressed and we must have an unwillingness to tolerate in our children a wrong response to parental admonition. It's as if you've come to your children with this thing that you, whatever it is, whatever the point is that you're coming to them, I want you to clean up your room. Let's make it something simple. Well, maybe not so simple. Let's make it something practical. I want you to clean up your room. And that's all you needed to do. Go clean up your room. But then they go, clean up my room. Oh, stop. Time out right there. Now the room is not the most important thing to deal with. But the heart which just revealed itself in the response. The issue, the room, is no longer the issue. The heart, always the heart. My son, Solomon says in here in the Proverbs, give me your heart. And mom and dad, if you stop short, and you are satisfied that the room got clean, but the response was never addressed, then you've just told your child, it's okay not to welcome, not to desire, good counsel and instruction, as long as you get the thing done. But you haven't captured his heart. You haven't captured her heart. So teach them by your unwillingness, dads and moms, to tolerate a wrong response to parental admonition. And by doing this, by the way, you are setting them up to be good desirers and welcomers and heeders of admonition from whatever quarter they come from throughout the rest of their lives. But it begins here at home. And finally, number three, cultivate firm but non-battering, non-irritating reproof. 
in your homes. In other words, be a wise giver. When correcting our children, it is too easy to slip into an adversarial mode and begin to speak in a way that can be unnecessarily irritating and even battering to our children. And though it is necessary correction and reproof, the way in which it is delivered can hinder its reception. And there are many passages in the book of Proverbs that speak of a wise counselor. A word that is wise. It is timely. It is delivered with compassion and sensitivity of the person getting the message. It is described as a beautiful picture adorned with silver and gold. We need to learn to be wise givers of counsel and admonition to our children. Because if we come to our children with this adversarial tone in our giving of instruction, our giving of admonition, if our words are those that are irritating, unnecessarily so, and even battering to them, calling them names, suggesting that they are not very smart, suggesting that they are lazy, in, in fact, unless in fact they are. But even then, we need to make sure that when we deliver the message to them, we are coming to them as those wise counselors who do the instruction with wisdom and discernment. And Paul must have understood this when he said, especially to fathers, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. We are, dads, sometimes too abrupt, too quick, less sensitive. And we can sometimes say good things in a way that is irritating to hear. We need to remember how we are coming across. And when we find that we have come across in a way that was irritating or battering or that provoked them unnecessarily to anger and to wrath, then we need to have the humility to go back to that child and say what daddy said was right, but the way daddy said it was very wrong. Do you forgive daddy? And when you do that, you will help not only yourself to become more and more sanctified because you're just beating your pride down at that point to go and ask the forgiveness of a child. But you are helping your child too to see in their dad someone who is serious about living a godly and a blameless life. So my closing admonitions would be these. Determine to fulfill your parental duty of bringing up your children in the instruction, in the discipline and admonition of the Lord, regardless of real, imagined, or even apparent results. But determine regardless of what you see in your children, would be determined to fulfill your parental duty regardless of the results. This is to act on principle. We should know what it is our duty to do and act on principle. Even when we don't see the effects of it coming out right, and we say, well, that's not working, so I'm going to throw that off and try something new. No, God's word hasn't changed. So adhere to what God has given. These are the means he has given. Instruction, discipline, admonition on how to bring up our children. 
Secondly, don't be crippled by a perfectionist mentality in your efforts to parent your children. Some say, well, I can't do it right. I don't know how. And every time I try this or that or the other thing, it fails. And I don't do it well. So therefore, I'm not going to do it. And we shrink back from duty because we have this perfectionist mentality. Keep this in your mind. Keep this before your eye. There is a cumulative effect that is underway here. Every day, you're not going to hit a home run. Every time you sit with a child to give instruction, it isn't going to go well. You're going to do something wrong. They're going to do something wrong. There's going to be a mess to have to straighten out. It's okay. The cumulative effect of what we do, faithfully seeking all our days to do exactly what Pastor Dan read from Deuteronomy this morning before the sermon. Whether you're lying down or walking in the way or rising up in the morning, teach these things to your children. Be constant. Be faithful. There isn't anything in the Word of God that says, do it perfectly or you've failed. But be faithful and be constant. Thirdly, determine to derive all your principles for parenting from God's word, as the Holy Spirit gives you understanding. Don't run first to the popular books, even in the Christian bookstores. Run first to God's word. Determine that's the primary source of wisdom. And then along the way, seek others who've proven to be helpful guides in God's word. To understand God's word even more. Next, always remember that you are involved in an enterprise that is yielding long term dividends for good or for evil. Don't lose sight of that very perspective that I set out at the beginning of this whole series. Have that eternal perspective. But what you are doing is instructing, you are disciplining a child who has a never dying soul, who himself and herself will one day stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, not in solidarity with you, mom and dad, but alone. Keep that eternal perspective. Always remember that you are involved in an enterprise that is yielding long-term dividends for good or for evil. And then finally, above all else, pray fervently, pray persistently, pray believingly that the Most Wise God will bless the means He has given for the bringing up of your children and that He would be pleased to draw them into saving union with his son, Jesus Christ. May God bless and help us, especially those who are now parents of young children, to heed God's counsel and to go about the work of bringing them up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us your word to instruct, counsel, guide, and lead us, and given your spirit to give understanding according to your word. I pray for every parent in this room, for everyone who will listen to this series in days and weeks to come, you would help them in this so vital a task that their children may come to fear the Lord, to know the Lord, that they all may come to a saving union with Jesus, your Son. We ask it in His name. Amen.